Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about regression, and in particular, using logarithms in the context of regression. Yeah, despite what the title currently says, that's what this video is about. Uh, as usual, there's a PDF down below. There's also the previous video that you might want to check out that we really introduced the idea of using logarithms in regression. This video is going to be about one particular example about how we might go through the process of looking at diagnostic plots to change the model that we're fitting, uh, to use logarithms on either the response or explanatory variable or both, and get to the point where we can actually write a summary for, say, a manuscript about what's going on. But there's one particular topic that's only a slide long here that I'm going to use at the end of the video today and that I want to get out of the way so that we can use it later. So I just want to remind you, we have our simple linear regression model and we have a credible interval that we can construct for the either the parameters, the beta naught or the beta one. So let's say for one of them, we have a credible interval that's LU. And we know from previous videos, this is also a confidence interval Right, so you could use either word, so confidence or credible interval. So we've got this interval LU, L is the lower endpoint, U is the upper endpoint of this interval that says, hey, we should believe that this parameter is inside this interval with a certain percentage, that's that 100, 1 minus A. But now in the previous video, what we saw is that we're often talking about uh, functions of these beta parameters. So in particular, we talked about a function like this, D times beta we talked about e raised to the beta power. And when you have those functions, you might want to, so you might want to have a credible interval for that function of the parameter beta. It turns out that it's actually pretty straightforward to get that. Um, and the key thing is that the function you're dealing with has to be monotonic. And what monotonic means is that the function is only increasing or decreasing. That is, it doesn't go up and then come back down or go down and then come back up. Okay, so as long as it's a monotonic function, then what I'm going to show you will work. And basically, all you have to do is you take that original interval, LU, and you calculate the function on both of the endpoints. So now we have a new interval. The function of L is the left endpoint. The function of U is the right endpoint. And that is now an, a credible interval for that function of the beta. And it has the same percentage that you had before. So if you had a 95% interval before, now you have a 95% interval uh, when you calculate this function. And that's a 95% interval for the function of the beta. Okay, so we're going to use this at the end of the slide set today. But I wanted to get it out of the way at the beginning. All right, so we're going to use an example here uh, that comes from a textbook on regression uh, called the Statistical Sleuth. I think this is a fabulous textbook. I highly recommend it. And no, I have not been paid uh, to say this, uh, but I have used it for a number of years uh, in teaching regression. So this uh, particular example comes from that textbook uh, and it says, all right, so you're in an industrial laboratory and you have uh, batches of an electrical insulating fluid and you uh, subject them to some constant voltages and you have some way of measuring when that fluid has broken down. And so the response is going to be the time it takes for that fluid to break down. Uh, as a quick summary, or maybe I should say this too, that this data set is in R. There's a Sleuth 3 package that has all of the data sets that are in this uh, textbook. That's one of the things I think it's great about the textbook is that they have all the data sets there for you to use and play around with. Um, and it, many of those data sets are discussed in the book itself. And so you can go back and see how the authors analyzed those particular data sets. All right, so here is this insulating data set example. You can see we have three variables. We have time, voltage, and group. We will come back to group in a bit. Um, but you can see here that time in particular seems a bit skewed, right? You notice here that the mean is much larger than the median. Uh, and so there's a clear expectation of right skewness with time. Remember, time is going to be our response variable. But other than that, things look generally okay. All right, so here's just a plot of that time as our response on the y-axis versus our explanatory variable, the voltage that was applied. Um, and here, what we can see, right, is that most of the observations uh, are pretty small. That is, you know, in some sense, when voltage gets too high, the breakdown time is pretty quick. Whereas when voltage is not so high, then it takes a while sometimes for that uh, fluid to break down. If you go ahead and sort of fit a regression line to these data, this is what it looks like. 
Uh, hopefully, it's clear to you that this does not seem like a very appropriate model for these data. Right? I mean, it doesn't really fit the data points that well, but you can also see that when voltage is small, there's sort of a wide spread of observations, whereas when voltage is big, the spread of observations is pretty narrow. But if you were to go ahead and sort of fit this and then run regression plots, which is, sorry, diagnostic plots, which is one way that you might have identified that things uh, were ill-fitting with this model, uh, these are a set of diagnostic plots. Uh, and some things you can see here that are concerning is uh, in the first top left plot, you see a clear trumpet pattern that we talked about in a diagnostics video earlier. Uh, maybe I'll go up here with the, there we go somewhere, uh, with the video link to that diagnostics video. Uh, but you can see that sort of trumpet pattern indicating a lack of constant variance. In the QQ plot, those points at the end kind of veer away, indicating some skewness. The Cook's distance plot uh, has an observation that's greater than 1, let alone greater than 4, divided by n, the number of observations. So clearly, it seems like some observations are having a large influence. Um, I don't know if there's too much to see from the index plot here that we haven't already seen in that residual plot. But so we have issues, okay? And now, one of the things that we might think about when we have a residual plot, that upper left one with a constant variance structure like this, is to take a log of our response. And so if we do that, this is now the same data, but we have the uh, y-axis, that breakdown time, we've used the log of that quantity. And actually what's plotted here is the regular quantity, but it's on a logarithmic scale. So we can still have the same uh, interpretation of these points, but you can see that on that y-axis, those grids aren't equally spaced, right? We go from 0.1 to 1 to 10 to 100. So they're not equally spaced in terms of being additive, but they're equally spaced in terms of their multiplicative relationship. So to go from 0.1, we multiply 10 to get to 1, multiply 10 to get to 10, multiply by 10 to get to 100, and then to 1,000. And now if we take a look at um, this regression plot, now things look pretty reasonable, right? Uh, the data, right, we see sort of an even spread all along that line. Um, we see certainly sort of more observations for later voltages than we saw for earlier voltages, perhaps. I probably should have jittered these values so you can make sure that there's no overlaps there. Um, but overall, a much better fit than we had before. If we take a look at our diagnostic plots, the diagnostic plots look much better. So our residual plot doesn't show that trumpet pattern anymore. Our QQ plot, uh, I had a version of this, and maybe it comes later, uh, where I have the uh, bands that the GG Resid panel package puts in there. Uh, but basically all these points are within the bands, a couple of them fall outside, but nothing too concerning. Our Cook's D-plot looks certainly much better. Maybe there's still one observation that's having an undue influence on our regression. The index plot uh, looks a little bit suspicious. We see some kind of grouping here, right, with observations sort of going up and then going, right, then a big jump down, then going up, big jump down. Uh, and if you remember, we actually did have observations that were grouped before. For the purpose of this video, I'm just going to ignore that, but that would be something that you would want to go back and investigate if this data were data that you were analyzing and publishing or presenting to a manager or something like that. So the two things I would look at would be that, the grouping, and then uh, this one observation that might be having a big influence. I'd probably try the regression with and without that observation and see if the results basically are the same, uh, and if so, move forward uh, with the uh, observation in the model. All right, so Nick, those two caveats aside, if we were to summarize the results of this regression, here are the results in R. And now you can see here where I'm taking the exponentiation of the two endpoints of these confidence and credible intervals, right? And so that just comes from that very first uh, slide that we had at the beginning of the video, where we talked about if you want to get the endpoints of the interval for a function of the beta parameter, you just have to take that function of those endpoints and that's what's going on in the second bit here. The first bit above it is just showing you the parameter estimates that you have that we can interpret in a second. And I probably should have started with the top. I don't know why I went in the reverse order, but at the very top, we also noticed that we, we did what's called shifting the intercept, right? So we subtracted 30 from our explanatory variable and that allows us to have an interpretation for the intercept that's more convenient. So here is that interpretation. So if I were writing this up in a paper, I would probably put something like this in the paper. At uh, 30 kilovolts, the median breakdown time is estimated to be 42 minutes with a 95% credible interval 
between 25 and 69 minutes. Then if we want to interpret the uh, slope, we would say something like this. For each one kilovolt increase in voltage uh, is associated with a 40% reduction in median breakdown time. And the uncertainty on that is 35% to 46%. Now you might be saying, where the heck did those numbers come from? I don't see those numbers anywhere, right? Okay, so the reason that they're uh, presented that the way they're presented is because you'll notice here that our estimate for e to the slope is what? About 0.6, okay? That means that our slope must have been negative because the only way we get values for e to something that's less than one is if the something was negative, that is the exponent was negative. In this case, our e to the beta one is 0.6, so beta one must have been negative. And that's a situation that what's gonna happen is that we're going to have a decrease in uh, the breakdown time as voltage increase. So rather than writing up these results as a statement about here's the increase and having the increase be negative or something that's a bit hard to interpret, uh, as you're writing this for your readers, you want to do the interpretation for them. And the way that you can do that interpretation when you have a negative slope in this example is to just take one minus e to that beta one and then multiply by 100. So you notice that we had 0.6, one minus 0.6 is 0.4, times 100 is the 40% that I've written down here. We can do the same thing with the two endpoints of the interval. So we have uh, negative what? Or we have one minus 0.67, that's about 0.32. We multiply by 100, that's the 32%. Uh, if we take one minus the 0.54, we have 0.46, multiply by 100, that's that 46%. So, um, in this video, I just went through an example of what happens when you use a logarithm as part of a regression and how you can still have a reasonably convenient interpretation. We did this through this breakdown times example. Uh, and I, one of the things I want to emphasize here is that there's sort of a lot of work in doing statistical analyses that go on behind the scenes, right? So in a manuscript, it's probably gonna only be these two lines Maybe you have a statement about R squared or something in there too, but only a couple of lines, but yet there was sort of a lot of work that had to go on behind the scenes in terms of fitting the model, looking at diagnostics, changing the model to fit so that the diagnostics are fitting better, right? And then uh, doing functions of the parameters, functions of the confidence intervals, credible intervals. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of work there. What ends up in the paper is a relatively small piece of information. All right, so we're gonna be moving on now in the next set of videos to talk about multiple regression. This is what the situation when we have more than one explanatory variable. Uh, as I mentioned before though, these results about logarithms really do apply both to simple linear regression and to multiple regression. Anyway, I hope to catch you on those future videos.